As many of you know, this is our 21st birthday party celebrations. And it's interesting just to remember how it all started. In 1992, we had this idea of looking at a couple of rather boring, unknown diseases and seeing if they were genetic. And the way to do this was a twin study. So the initial reason for using twins was to separate nature and nurture, to see whether a disease or a condition was more likely to be due to the genes you inherit or to the lifestyle you were living. What we were able to show in those early years was that many of these diseases, which were thought to just be due to old age, were in fact due to our genes. And this included things like osteoporosis, whether you fracture your bones, osteoarthritis, whether you have arthritis of your hips or your knees, cataracts, asthma. After the first 10 years, uh, the twin study evolved, if you like, and we then changed our research into trying to find out what these genes were. And this is the days when uh, we, we got most of the advantage from the non-identical twins because we did something called linkage analysis, which enabled us to show that large chunks of our DNA were being shared with people with certain diseases. And we did that for about 10 years, as well as finding certain interesting possible diseases. But ultimately that wasn't as successful as what we're doing now. And since 2007, the technology has evolved so that we can now measure a million markers. And with that information, we've been able to find hundreds of genes for hundreds of different traits. Most of it in collaboration with scientists around the world. And this has really led to this amazing explosion of knowledge we have. So that we know that for every trait there are hundreds of genes that are contributing to whether you're likely to get it or not. And that's been one of the big advances in how the genetic community has been sharing data with each other. My research using the Twins UK cohort has been on the genetics of common eye diseases, things like myopia or short sight or cataract, the age-related changes of the lens where it becomes less clear. We know that it's very common, it's becoming more common, but also our twin studies have told us that the heritability is very high. That means that genes are very important. So if your parent is short-sighted or both your parents are short-sighted, you have a much greater chance of being short-sighted. And we recently published a study working with another 27 uh, scientists across the world collecting more than 45,000 people with myopia and uh, measured their genes in a genome-wide association scan and what we found are 26 genes now that have been associated with myopia and we're hoping that's going to tell us a lot about the mechanisms of eye disease in particular why do people become short-sighted and hopefully in the future can we stop them becoming short-sighted. There's a, been a long history of pain research in the Department of Twin Research and, uh, and I've been working on pain and in particular low back pain for the last 10 years. Um, we've got several approaches to this. Uh, the first is to study uh, degenerative disc disease which we've done using the twins and uh, MR scans of their spine to look at changes in the disc that take place with age. We were among the first groups to show that in fact the changes that take place in the disc uh, are actually heritable after many, many years of occupational research in which it was thought that people's jobs caused um, low back pain. Uh, we and other twin groups show that there's a really significantly uh, high degree of genetic uh, influence on uh, the way in which the discs change over age. We've got a really great plan to study frailty in Twins UK and frailty is basically an accumulation of deficits that people might have um, accumulated over their life which leads to them being really much more vulnerable and at risk of a, just a small thing like a urinary tract infection causing them to then really decompensate and come into hospital. So frailty is a really important research area um, especially as um, the, the, the lifespan of the population is increasing, what we really want to do is make sure that lifespan is healthy. So we've been looking, we, we've been looking already at um, determinants of frailty with the twin cohort and we're planning a whole new study taking this further because our twins are on average age of 65 now while some of them are already 85. Um, over the next few years obviously um, that they, they will develop and we, we need to see um, how 
predictors that we've already tested for can predict which of those twins, which of those individuals are likely to become more frail later on. The last three years, what interested me more was the differences rather than the similarities. And we found that, that very often most twins don't die of the same diseases, they don't even get the same diseases. And when you scratch beneath the surface, they've often got different personalities and behaviours. And using a new science called epigenetics, which is basically how genes can be switched on and off by chemical signals, which we can now measure very well in the, in the, the blood and DNA of, of all the subjects, we can see these important differences between identical twins where one has a disease like cancer and the other doesn't. One of them has had their genes switched on or off. And this is a really exciting area of research that uh, we're doing on a very large scale. And we're now running the largest um, twin study of its kind in the world, looking at exactly that for many different diseases, looking at these really rare but fascinating pairs where one has the disease, one doesn't. And we're looking just to see those subtle changes in the genes that can tell us what's going on. And the results so far are really exciting and we've made some real breakthroughs in breast cancer, diabetes, um, depression and pain sensitivity and we're, we're about to do many more. Epigenetics is particularly important because it's actually reversible. The changes, for example, that a tumour makes to your genes by switching them off can be switched back on again by drugs that are, act in an epigenetic way. So all the signals we're picking up at the moment are going to be really useful in the future for people designing the new drugs, particularly that are going to look after uh, the next generation. So what's going to happen in the next 21 years? Even if not all of us are going to be around, it's fascinating to speculate because the speed of scientific discovery, the speed of the technology is such that it's really hard to comprehend what might be possible. No one even 10 years ago could believe what we're able to achieve now. I think we're going to move to an era where everybody's DNA is taken at birth and then at regular intervals to look and see how their genes and their DNA are changing. I think whoever's going to be around in 21 years is going to have a very ex exciting time and certainly twins are still going to be playing a major part in science as they have done so amazingly well for the last 21 years.